Now, Kira Prasad is going to take us through intersectionalism and the singularity, human evolution through structures of power. Take it away, Kira. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kira. Um, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Solis. So yeah, today I'll be talking about intersectionalism and the singularity, human evolution through structures of power. So I kind of just want to preface this by saying that um, my presentation will probably be unlike other ones we've had so far in this course, and that's partly because I don't really come from a medical background. So um, we're going to go through a bit more of a philosophical conversation today, so I hope that's okay with everyone. So to start off, uh, today I'm going to go through what intersectionalism is and give a little bit of background on what post-colonial theory is, and then apply them to uh, global health and the current status of global health today, uh, especially in relation to so social determinants of health. And then from there, we're going to look at how technology can be used to bridge the gap in this health disparity. And then lastly, we'll be applying that and the singularity to human evolution. So in order to talk about um, medicine and the future of medicine and technology, I feel like it's relevant to start the conversation in uh, a discussion about the past. And the past that I'm choosing to focus on today is colonialism. And I know it seems pretty far-fetched from what we're usually talking about, but I'm hoping it will make sense once I get there. So colonialism is a really powerful history in the way that it shaped many countries through time, both the colonial power and the colony. So uh, colonialism is something that's unique in that it's inherently marked by unequal relationships. So basically, one profits off the other. One rules while the other is subservient. One has power and the other does not. And this widespread ideology created what we call this binary system of representation between the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, and while the traditional sense of colonialism isn't really around anymore, uh, if you talk to any scholar, it's evident that colonization has produced a lasting legacy of power structures in the system of representation and has taken new forms. So post-colonial theory looks at issues of power, at uh, economics, politics, religion, and culture, and links these elements together in relation to colonial hegemony. So similarly, intersectionalism, for those of you who don't know, uh, describes the intersections between forms of oppression, domination, and discrimination. So today, I want to apply a post-colonial intersectional analysis to global health and explore how power structures tra translate with the singularity and the evolution of humankind. This is a symbolic representation of oppression that's called a power flower. So basically, this demonstrates how um, an individual's identity has numerous facets. And depending on which category you're looking at, you could either dominate with the, or identify rather, with the dominant group, uh, therefore the privileged group, or the non-dominant group, which is called oppressed. So uh, looking at these, um, typically the dominant group in sex would be male, in race would be, in, would be white, in language would be English, in geographical region would be the developed world. But you can see how across an ind any individual's identity, you would have different areas where you are privileged and where you are oppressed. And so what intersectionalism kind of describes is that you can distinguish these categories in a power flower, but you can't actually distinguish the oppression an individual would feel across any number of these categories. So what does that have to do with health? Well, first let's just introduce the context of global health. I want to use the definition the University of Alberta Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry throws up because I think it really aptly describes what I'm talking about here. So global health is a concept that focuses attention on inequalities and disparities in health, including health status and access to health services, all with a strong focus on fostering justice and ensuring human rights. So the WHO says that the right to health means that governments must generate conditions in which everyone can be as healthy as possible. Such conditions range from ensuring availability of health services, healthy and safe working conditions, adequate housing, and nutritious food. And I would assume that most of you would agree with me uh, in, in believing in the right to health, and that health is a basic human right. So if we kind of relay this back to global health then, uh, the WHO lists a couple of statistics to kind of frame the current state. So as listed here, it kind of uh, numbers out the number of individuals infected with HIV AIDS, the number of mothers that die each year uh, in childbirth, 
the, the number of individuals killed by tobacco or, or traffic road accidents, or the number of children that die under the age of five, uh, or individuals affected by depression. So, I mean, these statistics, um, what's, what's lacking in the description here is kind of uh, a kind of hidden message. Um, of those infected with HIV AIDS, 70% of the deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Of those infected with depression, fewer than half have access to adequate health and health care and treatment. And almost all of the children who die under the age of five each year could be saved if they had access to simple and affordable interventions such as exclusive breastfeeding, uh, inexpensive vaccines and medication, and clean water and sanitation. So the point I'm trying to make here is though these stats reflect the, the current state of global health, there's a disproportionate representation of individuals living in poverty. So lower socioeconomic um, status is often reflective of corrupt or poorly run government, um, limited healthcare access or poor healthcare infrastructure, treatment and um, prevention affordability issues, and low education. So these circumstances are more concisely referred to as social determinants of health. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this term. Um, so basically, this kind of produces the health disparity that we see in global health, both between developed and developing countries and within a country. So for instance, if you look at a country like um, Bolivia, if you compare the number of infant um, mortalities in uh, educated mothers versus non-educated mothers, again, there's a disproportionate representation where there's a lack of education. So it's really clear how these things are really tightly linked. The thing about this to keep in mind is that these social determinants are kind of laid out by chance. It's, it depends on where you're born, what type of family you're raised in, um, whether you have access to school, whether you live in an urban or rural setting, um, what your gender is, whether you face racism or not. All of these things that you can kind of see connect back to the power flower that I showed earlier. And so governments have been trying to kind of acknowledge that social determinants of health are really important. Um, and so they adopted the Rio Political Declaration in 2011 um, and set out to act in these five areas. But um, while this agenda has been moved forward, I, I'd like to say that progress is kind of bittersweet. Um, over the past two decades or so, the average lifespan overall has increased by five years, and that's great. The only problem is that while this is happening, we also see the widening disparity. The rich seem to be getting richer, and the poor seem to be getting poorer. So if you look at America right now, the top 1% of American families own more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. And I'm sure that's a statistic most of you are familiar with. So what does this have to do with this course? Well, when we talk about bridging the gap in global health, we talk about bridging the gap of this disparity, it seems necessary to talk about the role technology might play in that. Uh, particularly in this course, we've been talking about technology and the future of medicine. So already we see the way that globaliza globalization has led to the widespread use of specific technologies, namely the internet. Compared to 30 years ago, it's virtually impossible for us to buffer ourselves from the rest of the world. Even if you're in the most remote corner, um, we have all of this technological information accessible at our fingertips all the time on our phones. We're connected to it. And being constantly plugged in kind of has its perks sometimes because it's allowed for individuals to be better integrated into the world beyond themselves, um, which has then positively impacted the way that we develop technologies. So in Lab MP, we've discussed many technological advances that could potentially revolutionize medicine and healthcare. So this awesome infographic I found basically lays some of those out. In prevention, we're getting to the point of working towards do-it-yourself biotechnology. We're getting clinical trials in microchips instead of animal models. Um, we're working towards gamification-based wellness. And all of these could greatly change the way we prepare for the management of health issues and disease in the future. In terms of data input, we're, we're doing big things with big data. We're working towards personalized genomics, holographic data input, robotic nursing assistant, assistance. In therapy, we're working towards optogenetics, evidence-based mobile health, 3D, 3D printed biomaterials and drugs, telemedicine, humanoid robots, and augmented human capability. This is all not far off the horizon. And the consequences of this 
have started to include artificial intelligence in medical decision support. Uh, recently, there was a publication about a psychologist that was a, basically artificial intelligence that had the, the ability to empathize. So again, we're getting to this point where we're talking about things like the singularity. Um, and I mean, before long, we'll have virtually reality applications, digitized brains, recreational cyborgs, transhumanism, all the things we've been talking about in this course. So it's apparent that the future of medicine is already on its way. So I want to shift gears a bit because as we move towards the singularity, we're prompted to make a sort of philosophical existential consideration for how the transformation of global health through these technologies that, are, that kind of revolutionize our healthcare, how that would affect the evolution of humankind as a species. And so we've talked about this in terms of the ethics of using certain technologies and, and how that would change and who that would represent and who that would serve. So for the purpose of this, this presentation, um, while there are probably multiple ways to look at it, I'd like to think of there being two main options when we're talking about human evolution and the singularity. So the first is the perspective of individuals like Stephen Hawking, uh, who stated in relation to artificial intelligence that the singularity and technology's supremacy over human intelligence could mark the end of our species. So if this were to happen, hum homo sapiens would become a distant thing of the past, uh, replaced by the very technology that we have created. So in kind of trying to, to uh, adapt evolution as a powerful creative tool, we could end up creating smarter than something we could create. Um, and this is kind of a timeline that we can only really speculate about. And it's a little bit cynical and depressing, but basically it would mean that we would have lived our time and we would be replaced by something better than us. That's what evolution says. So kind of a more optimistic viewpoint would be uh, kind of in line with someone like Ray Kurzweil, who says that instead we should perceive the singularity as our own human evolution. That by creating and utilizing this technology, we advance our longevity and then improve our health. We increase our capability as a species. We build our capacity in our own human intelligence. And we could transform into like a better breed of human, like Juan Enriquez's idea of uh, Homo evolutus, a different type of human that is characterized specifically by the innovative technology we have. So if the second of these two fates of evolution is true, this is all hypothetically speaking, then it would mean that we're naturally evolving towards a greater humankind with a singularity. The thing with that is it's likely that our evolution would continue taking place and operating through these power structures that have been in place since colonial times. So with the privilege and bias society creates towards a dominant group, the disproportionate representation we see in health could endure to a place where the voice of the less privileged eventually just fades out. So those with the greatest chance at evolution and greatest benefit to, uh, chance to benefit from these technologies and the singularity would be those less subject to social determinants of health or those who are less oppressed by society. So what would this look like? By the current definition of what we consider dominant, would this mean the future would be predominantly uh, white, North American, English-speaking, able-bodied, urban-dwelling, heterosexual males. I had a kind of different idea of what the future would look like. So obviously this lack of diversity would be really problematic. And what's more complicated is if we look at Maslow's hierarchy as a guide, this is just as a guide because there are some things that are flawed here, but using it as a guide. It's evident that those kind of struggling to meet the first two or three strata of basic needs, so things like health or social belonging in a group depending on a certain facet of identity, face more challenge in reaching that peak of self-actualization, face more challenge in realizing their own potential and evolving. So that's kind of an interesting point to make in that from the get-go, from the moment an individual is born, they face a sort of systemic inequality. So to compound the issue, um, evolution, the very idea of it runs off this idea of survival of the fittest. So that's kind of inherently unjust if you think about it in that not everyone in the world has an equal or equitable chance of being fit. So if you permit me, I'm, I have a bit of a cheesy metaphor to kind of sum this up. 
One way of looking at this is that it's like saying that life is like a race and that every person has an equal chance of winning, of evolving, of achieving health. And then you have governments and organizations trying to make equal policy. And um, that would be metaphorically like giving everybody who's running the race a pair of shoes. But it's the same pair of shoes. And the problem with this is that rather than giving people shoes to fit their feet, something that's equitable in policy, equitable in the way that we do things, we expect that everybody is starting at the same place. And that's just not true. So this is the myth of meritocracy, right? This is something we see in basically every social structure we have. And I'm not going to get into the theoretical implications of that, because that's kind of a discussion for another day. But the connection to power structures in relation to health and in relation to technology is very clear in my mind. Basically, society's dominant privilege group holds a majority share of power such that others, those who are oppressed, face a greater hindrance to achieving their health and their own evolution. So that means the various um, identities an individual can have influences their right to health. And this will virtually remain unchanged unless the singularity and technology can begin to develop with intersectionalism. So though the developers, distributors, healthcare practitioners, and patients around the world are all working to integrate these new health technologies to benefit health for all, I think more intersectionalism is needed. So let's say, using the example of mobile health, mHealth, that one day this becomes a fully integrated technology in every country in the world. So there is no discrimination based on whether your country is developing or developed. The problem with that is even though an individual might have access to this healthcare technology, they may still face discrimination or prejudice based on some other facet of their identity. So perhaps they would be um, treated unfairly based off of their se uh, sexual orientation or off of um, their marital status or their age. So you can see how, though we have all of these steps forward and we're kind of moving in the right direction, more kind of criticism and, and this intersectional thinking is needed. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's necessary because I think that if we're going to continue moving forward, we can't just take one aspect or one petal of a power flower and in integrating a technology and expect that that's going to result in a really dramatically different and changed future. Um, especially if we want to see that there's equal representation and diversity and individuality preserved. A lot of the time when we've been talking about this, these technologies, there's the fear that we're going to lose privacy, that we're going to lose individuality even if it's on the basis of individuals being different and their value of what's right and wrong. So I think the risk of losing diversity is a fairly harmful social impact. And I think that in, in order to not complacently perpetuate structures of power that position some people over others um, and trying to positively, Im positively impact the evolution of our species, technological advances need to start making considerations of more intersectionalism. So I believe that one way of us doing this, of students in this classroom, we're not policy makers, but we can still advocate. We can be engaged in kind of a social critique of the world around us. If we want to dream of a future that um, kind of stops manifesting these forms of oppression in different, different ways, um, it's kind of necessary for us to each acknowledge the areas where we identify outside of the norm and where we are privileged. And I think feeling a sense of global responsibility, feeling a sense of global citizenship will help us advocate for the future because even though it may not be in our lifetime or our, our children's lifetime, when the singularity happens, it will change our civilization. And if we want that to be something of equitable diversity, um, then we have to start kind of voicing that. And I'm sure, if, for those of you who are kind of following along with me here, this probably sounds really idealistic, because I'm talking about a world that's free of discrimination, free of prejudice, free of systemic inequality, where individuals have the fair chance to evolve and to achieve health. So that kind of sounds like world peace, doesn't it? So I'm a bit cynical that that's going to happen in my lifetime or anytime soon, um, especially since we've been on this trajectory since colonial times. But I think that perhaps with the singularity and with intersectional healthcare technologies and individual advocacy for a different future, 
a way of evolving and overturning the oppressive structures that humanity has been using for years, perhaps this piece is something that's imaginable. So now I'll open it up for questions. I'm so, you know, you, you were talking very much about desirable behaviors that one could uh, model, and in the last week, something has been suggested that I find very exciting. You know, we're all concerned about when robots become sentient, how will they treat us? And what's been pointed out is that you can ask how will they treat each other. You can model that, how they should treat each other. And as robots go from the state they are today of being relatively dumb to being sentient, we can have an uh, influence over all, all the sorts of things that you've been talking about. You know, will short robots be you know, discriminated against that. That's sort of a simple way to think about it. But using their treatment of each other as a model for the way human beings should be treated and human beings should treat each other. And it, it, it makes it a subject for study by people who right now probably don't think it's, it's something that they have to spend a single second thinking about. It kind of broadens this whole area of, of uh, how should human beings treat each other and 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 you know what are, what are the sources of prejudice how can how can we avoid those so if if we're starting with the current state of uh, human beings it a lot of that is very complicated to suddenly change but on the other hand as as we're teaching machines how to do this stuff it 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 gives us another way to work on this uh, which, I don't know, I find exciting <laughs> anyway. I'm really curious to hear what you guys kind of think about this issue because as Dr. Sol just kind of pointed out, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting con to consider what that would look like if, if there wasn't any kind of translation of human social interaction and human structures of, uh, structures of power given to a new species of, or robotics or artificial intelligence. Could there be kind of like a clean start? Would there be, is that possible? Is that something to imagine for us? I mean, it's kind of hard to conceive something so different from ourselves, but maybe it's an option. I think to achieve some positive outcomes from the integration of technology into the human experience, we need to start out on the right foot. We need to start out now because we're seeing things like advanced prosthetics coming out and these will only become more advanced as we do more research. If we start out on the wrong foot, if there's inequitable distribution of these technologies and resources, I think that it would be very easy for that state to pick up momentum and become unstoppable because technology accelerates so quickly. So I think Really, in order to avoid screwing ourselves, we need to start thinking about it right now. Yeah, I agree. Um, I have similar ideas, although um, ideally speaking, it sounds really um, fascinating and it sounds very promising to think that as we move into the singularity, all of these systemic oppressions will be gone. Uh, however, even right now with the evolving technology that we have, uh, technology is playing a huge role in um, expanding the virtual gap between the developed world and developing countries. And the poor are getting poorer while the rich are getting richer. So if we, as uh, Michael said, if we, start out, if we start out with the wrong food, then we're actually um, moving towards a system that uh, specifically benefits and that specifically is ideal for uh, people who are on the status quo. Um, so any idea? Yeah, that's basically my argument as well. Is Like I mentioned, uh, what the future of the world could look like if it continued. Basically a bunch of straight white guys in their middle age. That's, that's not really diversity then. It's basically giving more in the hands of people who already have a lot to begin with. Um, so basically the way that I've looked at it is it's not just about the technology that we're creating and it's not just about 
the access, we have to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives. But this is a multifaceted issue, so it cannot be solved by just one direction. Um, and I don't really know the answer to that. I don't know what all of those different directions could possibly be. But as soon as we can have more people kind of thinking about it, we can kind of start brainstorming and figuring out how to solve and shape these technologies to be integrated into a world that doesn't keep feeding into that status quo. Um, so I think uh, it's interesting to look back at what oppression looks like now as compared to what it looked like before. And you bring up the point of the straight white male, but I think that's, while it's still present, I think it's becoming more and more a relic of the past because, I mean, you brought up colonialism. And if we look at colonialism, uh, you know, when, when the British colonized a lot of uh, India or Africa and when the French colonized a lot of Africa, there wasn't any question of, oh, let's pick out the smart Indians and the smart Africans and make them part of our clique and put all the dumb ones down. It was just, I'm white, you're not, so I'm better than you. Even if, like, you may be the next genius, you know, you may be Einstein in disguise, but because you're not white, you don't count. But if we look at society nowadays, the president of the United States is a black man. I mean, sure, he's half white, but his appearance is that of a black man. And there's multiple, multiple respected women, Hillary Clinton, who are, namely, who are in power, and uh, Angela Merkel, who are very, very respected people. So I think oppression is changing from, you know, a straight white male category to more of a educated, connected, and wealthy category to those who are not. Because, I mean, you see a gated community, like if you look at many news documentaries, when they show the lives of the wealthy or when they show uh, where a lot of these individuals live, it's very, you know, a gated communities, secluded areas, and they all seem to have parties with each other. And these, par like, and these parties don't exclude people like Obama or people like Hillary Clinton. They're in fact very, very like, expected to come and they're honored guests at these places. Instead, these parties exclude what these people fear are the common folk, you know, uh, everyone else who doesn't have the $10 million. And I think part of that is like human fear of lack of being able to relate, you know, because um, I can't relate to a five-year-old because I have different concerns in life. And it's the same case when you listen to a lot of people like Mitt Romney speak about, or Ann Romney when they were running for president, to speak about their lives of, oh, we had very little money in college, we just had to use the stocks that our parents gave us. It's hard for them to realize that the average person doesn't have stocks that their parents gave them to get dividends from and live life, right? So I think if we're talking about oppression, we need to address the concerns of exclusionism more than here's a type of person, the straight white guy, that I think has been vilified in a lot of society. And I say that as, you know, not a white guy. But I think uh, in terms of oppression, we need to and if we're going to work on it in terms of uh, singularity, I think we need to deal with it in the sense that we need to try and integrate people no matter who they are rather than say, oh, you know, uh, this guy's a straight white guy, so he's at the top and he'll always be at the top. Because that's really, really not what's happening today. There's lots of straight white guys who are homeless or who are veterans and can't get aid to live, right? So I think it's going to be difficult because humans are more or less built for competition. That's really what pushed us up to the level we are now. That's why we're sitting in nice climate controlled rooms and messing around on computers. But I think it's possible if we work less on the stereotype of what is good and what is bad and more on the how can we prevent seeing others as below us no matter what they look like or who they are. Because it's really becoming a connections game more than anything nowadays where the CEO of one company is the nephew of the CEO of another company who's the daughter of the founder of a third company. And it's, it's really getting to a disturbing point where the elite are remaining elite forever. But it's not based on culture or racial backgrounds, but more of a, I guess, Yeah, I'm going to jump in here because, so basically I just want to explain. When I say the straight white male, basically what I'm getting to to that is not talking about that that person is in power, but that is the typically stereotypical dominant group, right? And I agree with you on basically all of the points that you're making that when I brought up the power flower, that's kind of the, the same point that we're not looking at an individual for one or three of the 15 to however many categories you can identify with. Obviously, every individual person has 
numerous facets of their identity. And in some areas, though they identify with the dominant group, they're still oppressed in other areas. And, and I agree with what you're saying. It's not even about, uh, it can never solely be just about race or about educational background or about wealth because it's all of those things combined. And when we, the reason why I draw it back to colonial structures is because though it's not the same, the exact same um, uh, force that's fueling this, this power structure, you have the same type of representation where you have a binary between those in power and those in not. So those in power can separate themselves from the other, this kind of orientalist thinking where the other is lesser, is kind of exoticized, they're different and I'm separate from them, that kind of thing, where it still positions people. Whatever the reason, this kind of oppression exists whether it's a, a social determinant of health or type of identity or, or any of those types of things. And kind of where I was kind of going with that right now, thinking about um, the way that oppression affects health in the future and the singularity is because uh, we're talking about people who are so complex, right? And we're talking about complex social interactions people have with each other that a lot of the times the way that power gets assigned is very arbitrary, like you were saying. All of a sudden someone has X amount of dollars and they fit into a, an elite. It's something that's, that's sometimes very trivial, but the, the structures that are, that are guiding those interactions kind of are still the same over time. And my concern is that is if those structures stay in place, they can take different forms under technology. So maybe you'll have, you'll have someone in power or a robot in power or whatever and someone not, and it's still kind of guided by the same force where people are confused about what, what they're kind of striving for. And you do have this exclusionary principle where it's still kind of going on this idea of competition, this survival of the fittest, where how are you supposed to evolve or, or achieve a sort of, um, for, for me, it was achieving health when you're not at the same footing, and that footing keeps changing all the time, but it's still maintained in a way where there's some people who have, pow some people who have power and some people who just don't. And it's, a, it's like kind of a direct split, and it's not 50-50, it's 1% and 99%. That's kind of what I was getting at there, is it's so complicated and that there's, there's too many kind of contributing factors to it to say that it's caused by any one thing, but it's guided by this sort of like framework that's been around for ages, the way people think about how, how to interact with other people. I'm afraid it's going to translate to when we think of the way technology is used as any other resource. I just have a couple of comments to make um, in response to Anchor's questions. So um, just to start with, um, it was not always, you're black, I'm white, I have to rule you. So, because at the beginning you said in colonial times, nothing really mattered, it was white versus black. However, the situation was not like that. Just to pull an example, um, Ethiopia and uh, one of the two independent countries in Africa, uh, they were black. They had black kings, but they had international foreign affair relationships with the United States and with your different European countries. It was um, a nation that was the, one of the first members of the League of Nations, and the Europeans were able to maintain that relationship with an African state, with a black king. And even in Rwanda, when the French colonized Rwanda, they made sure that there was a divide and rule policy where they created their own clique with a certain tribe, the Tutsi. And after they left, the Rwandan genocide exploded because they made that divide and they chose to associate themselves with uh, a certain tribe in the country. So it was not, uh, racism is not, um, I don't think of it as a specific skin color situation since the colonial times. So that's one thing uh, people usually forget when they say, oh, it has changed, you know, black people are in politics or Barack Obama is the president of the United States. It's not always a mere skin color. It hasn't always been a mere skin color situation. A lot of so socioeconomic factors play a role in this. So when we don't really uh, realize how much, what really uh, brought this whole thing in the world, then we try to think, oh, we have improved so much and everything has changed very well. Um, I mean, definitely the world have, has changed so much and we have to not acknowledge that, but at the same time we have to um, we have to realize that like, we, we are all privileged. People usually fear the word privilege because it makes them feel guilty. It makes them feel as though they've contributed to this 
system of oppression. But the fact is, every single one of us, just because we are alive and just because we're sitting here and having an education, we are privileged. And uh, in realization of that, it's not to make us feel guilty, but it, uh, it is to make us feel uh, compassionate and to be aware of uh, circumstances people can be through all around the world. Doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter what gender they are. However, statistically and scientifically speaking, certain races, certain genders are strongly associated with lower uh, socioeconomic statuses. And um, to change that, we also have to change the people who are um, active contributors in like making laws, laying down policies, and everything. And, and even when you talked about social clubs, one of the most prestigious golf club in the, in the world just uh, accepted the first black person in 2002 or something, and that was Tiger Woods and Condoleezza Rice. The first woman was Condoleezza Rice. First black person was Tiger Woods. This, is, this just happened like seven, eight years ago. That's shocking. So. We're still, we still have battles to fight, and it's very important to never forget that. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not denying that we have battles to fight. That was the entire point of my statement of how there is exclusion. But the argument that racism wasn't really based on skin color and was actually based on economics isn't one that holds true. Because you can argue Ethiopia, yeah, but Ethiopia wasn't colonized. And I agree, they had black kings, they were admitted to the League of Nations, but you're joking yourself if you think that Ethiopia was on the same political standing as Britain was or France was, simply because they were stronger. And if you want to talk about how the, when the French colonized Rwanda, they picked the Tutsis, I agree, they did. And they supported the Tutsis. But that doesn't mean the Tutsis were in power. It's the same way that India had multiple political leaders. Gandhi was allowed to gain a massive following, but he was allowed to gain the following. The British could have stepped in at any moment and stopped it. The reason they allowed it is because they feared, you know, oh, this might escalate into protest, which ironically it did. But at the end of the day, it wasn't Gandhi going, hey, I'm on top of the British. Screw you guys. I do what I want. It was the British going, eh, he's kind of okay there. He's not causing much trouble. He's preaching nonviolence. He's not bringing weapons and arms. Let's let him do his thing. That's the point of white people being above brown people or black people in colonial times. It's not that there were no powerful brown people or black people or whatever, it's that above them all were the white people. And it wasn't because the guy on top of all the brown people in India were the, was the smartest guy in all of India, it was because he was white and he was given governing power by the British people, right? And I do agree, we're all privileged and there's a lot of battles to fight, but I think racism has gotten a lot, a lot better. And I say this as someone who isn't white, right? But there's definitely a lot of battles to fight, which I'm not gonna argue. Like, I 100% agree with that. To leave this on a, on a positive note, I also kind of just wanna say that, um, thinking about, I mean, we do come from a very complicated past, but I kind of just wanna move forward thinking about the future, something that doesn't have to be as riddled with injustices and difficulties. Um, so I hope that I mean, my kind of take home message from today is that we do have all of these different things that are so complicated that still kind of trigger our emotions as we're thinking and talking about them today. And if we want to change the way and we want to continue on a trajectory of where we've been coming from improving in these areas, then I think we do, again, we have to be aware of our privilege and also advocate, advocate for the type of future that we want. Thanks. Hey, thanks very much. That was a great session and we'll see you on Tuesday.